All right, here we go. A special edition of Knicks Fan TV. CP from Knicks Fan TV checking in here. And special guest checking in from the NBA bubble down in Orlando. He was a former Nick from the 04 to 08 season. Currently with the Brooklyn Nets. Three-time NBA Six Man of the Year. Welcome back to the NBA JCJ crossover. Jamal Crawford in the building. Jamal, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on the show. I'm good, man. Honored to be on. Thank you. I saw a lot of Knicks gear back there, so I yeah. know you've been riding for them for a while. Uh, orange and blue ride or die, man, and, and was a big fan of yours back in those days, man. So, um, you know, first of all, like I said, welcome back into the league. How does it feel to be back? To be honest with you, CP, sometimes I wake up like, man, did this really happen? Like, because, you know, when you've been out the league for 15 months, uh, that kind of becomes a new normal. You know what I mean? As far as uh, being in the league for 19 years, uh, being out the league for 15 months and, and not knowing if that call would ever come again. So being here now in this place, I'm just thankful. I'm grateful. I'm humbled by it and enjoying every single moment to be around the guys again, to see different guys in the league, uh, to see friends from competing against all these years and just, you know, being back and playing against the highest uh, level of players in the world. So I'm, I'm excited. True indeed, man. And you mentioned being around the guys again. What's that atmosphere like down in the bubble? You know, we get bits and pieces from social media. Yeah. Um, it looks like like an AAU basketball tournament like back in the yeah. day. How, how would you describe it? That's exactly what it is. Imagine that, but all the, the different teams just stay at the same hotel. So it's not uncommon to see uh, a whole team in a pool workout or see different people going to eat or, you know, playing cornhole or whatever it might be. You know, you see guys that you would normally just see on the court or maybe at dinner every now and again, but we see these guys every single day and they see us every single day. So um, it really is a fraternity, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's uh, it's like the best AAU tournament with the best players in the world. That That's dope, man. Now, now going back to that phone call, as you said, you have been on the sidelines for 15 months, getting yeah. used to being at, at home, that extended time with your family, I'm sure was a blessing as well. Now, when you get that call from Brooklyn, there's extra circumstances on top of it. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We have COVID-19, you know, ravaging our community, especially, you know, Seattle and the Washington area felt it pretty heavy as well. You have, yeah. you know, the uprising due to the police killings as well. You know, uh, the black community severely impacted by that. You being a community leader, certainly feeling that. And then, you know, like I said, you, you have this extended time with your family. You have your son who's matriculating through the game as well. How did all those factors weigh in on, on you deciding to make a comeback? Yeah, you're right. It was like different layers to it, right? At first, it was the pandemic we were dealing with. Well, first, it was before the pandemic because I wasn't playing. So that was one layer of just getting a lot of extra family time, you know. And I was watching games some nights and then, you know, later on that night when I'm, I think I'm about to watch games, my daughter's like, hey, I want you to take me to the dance. And without question, I'm like, let's go. And not knowing I'd be going to a dance that day, spending three hours with her, watching her with her friends and having a good time. Moments like that, you can't get back. So I was really appreciative of that extra time. It became routine, you know, going to my daughter's uh, dances or going to my son's basketball practices or his games or going to my other daughter's gymnastics classes. So it just became everyday life. And then from there, dealing with the pandemic, we really... Uh, my wife dialed in on remote schooling and, and really got that going for us because the first couple of days we were all like, you know, chickens with our head cut off. Like, what are we going to do? And she kind of set it in order and we kind of got a routine with that. And then from that point, um, just seeing the, the senseless killings and, and the, the murders going on, you know, that was a whole different emotion. It's tough. Yeah, it's, it's tough, right? So all those different things and different emotions uh, played into it. And then getting this call to come. You know, obviously I, I'm a hooper and I love to play, but like you said, I want to think about all those things. So we started checking into, you know, how the NBA was going with the protocol as far as testing, because at the time, I don't know if it's still the case, Florida was really spiking up yeah. in cases, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So just seeing it from afar, we don't know exactly what's going on. And then like, I didn't want the the, the movement to lose momentum on the streets. You know what I mean? As far as uh, the awareness we're trying to bring and the justice we're trying to bring. So I love how the NBA is going about it. You know, uh, always in the players, especially putting the, the the awareness out on the streets. Even though we're here and we're doing something we love to do, this isn't the most important thing going on in the world right now. And we're going to constantly remind you and remind people of that until there's justice. So, yeah, it was something definitely to think about. But in the end, it just made sense on all levels. 
It's a beautiful thing. Family is everything to me as well, man. So it was good to see that, you know, they had you back in that decision. And you also mentioned, you know, the NBA and their response to what's going on. And as you see in the player post-game interviews, you see Paul George and, and um, um, Smart from Boston, you know, mentioning Breonna Taylor, making sure that her case and her cause is not lost in it. I know you in particular with the player um, jerseys, you're going to be repping equality. And also, uh, we've heard that Jacques Vaughn has, you know, made an effort to uh, bring up our causes and the issues plaguing our communities prior to each practice. So it seems like the NBA has been doing a pretty good job in that regard. They definitely have. And, and they're very supportive of whatever we want to do as well. You know, so besides the NBA stuff, like I, I am into a cause with Bill Russell, Dead Left Shrimp, Isaiah Thomas, uh, about bringing uh, awareness, bringing funds to local uh, nonprofits right there on the front line from the Black Lives Matter movement to, you know, local community centers, people that are affected every day by our community. So, you know, bringing money and awareness to them, matching some of the money that comes in. So the people on the front line that are dealing with this every day, you know, can have the, the, the funds and the resources to kind of continue the movement. So just doing different things. It's called, that cause is called Erase the Hate. You know, so we're trying to erase the hate of what's going on in, in society and trying to spread love and spread love to people in our community. So, yeah, just doing different things like that. That's a commendable feat. And and I know you, you're a big, you know, community leader uh, in that Seattle and Washington metro area. So I definitely wish you continued success on that. And any way we Thank can you. get involved, I, I'd love to do so. Um, I appreciate it. With, with the Nets... You know, coming back, you, you're now the elder statesman in the, in the league. Vince Carter has right. passed that torch. You're the OG, triple OG. What do you feel like you want to bring to this next team to, to really make an impact? I think some of everything, to be honest with you. I think everything in my toolbox from leadership, uh, you know, on and off the court, bringing a calmness to the court, uh, bringing some direction from a player perspective, uh, bringing scoring, you know, bringing playmaking, you know, just bringing all those different things uh, that encompass kind of navigating the situation, you know, and so bringing a certain confidence to our team, all those different things uh, that I'm looking forward to the challenge. It won't be easy. Obviously, uh, we're kind of going through all this for the first time together. You know, we got our one of our players, Dante Hall, he, he came and got through the whole program on the first pre, uh, scrimmage game. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so it won't be easy, but I think if we all lean on each other, and continue on the right path and represent the Nets well, you know, I think it'd be a good showing for all of us. For you personally, what would you say is going to be the biggest adjustment? Is it getting up to that game shape, game speed? Is it the chemistry with the teammates, getting used to Jock Vaughn's scheme or how he wants to do things? Or is it just the psychological factor and just playing these games under a unique circumstance, no fans, testing every day, and, and so on? Yeah, I think, to be honest with you, the first one. Because, because, like, even though I hadn't played in 15 months in a real game, when the when the season was going on, I was playing four times a week, you know, just like I was in the season. So I was tip-top shape. Not It's the difference between being in shape and being in basketball shape. So I was in tip-top basketball shape at that time. But then when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody had a quarantine. So at that point, for the last four months, I haven't seen anybody. You know, I've just been shooting outside or working out with my son. But you know how it is being a hooper. It's different from – doing one-on-one -on -one workouts, yeah. playing five-on-five, five, you know, banging against bodies and guarding and going to score on people. So that part is coming back. The first couple of days of practice, uh, the first day it felt like I was running in mud, and the second day <laughs> it felt way better, right? And each day has gotten better and better since. So, you know, I'm getting close as possible to being in actual game five-on-five five shape. And by the time the season rolls around, uh, I'll be ready. Now, um, segue into to the Knicks, your old team. You know, yeah. uh, right now, Knicks are in the middle of a, a coaching search. It's, it's been a three-week process. Seems like it's going to be delayed into next week. Uh, odds on favorite right now is Tom Thibodeau, your old coach at uh, at the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, when you had declined your player option for the Timberwolves uh, in previous interviews with the Seattle Times and, and the Athletic, you had, you had mentioned that you want to make sure that your next stop will be a, a good fit for you. You know, maybe alluding right. to the fact that Minnesota really wasn't uh, the best situation for you. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? On, you know, what happened in Minnesota? Yeah, I don't want to look back too much, but for me personally, it just isn't, you know, kind of what I was told how it was going to play out. 
And my thing is, I have no problem with any role. Just be straight up with me. And that situation just wasn't a situation where I felt like I was enjoying um, playing basketball, to be honest with you. So for me, I opted out and just kept it moving and haven't really looked back since. You, you had also uh, experienced close to a career low in minutes. You know, one of the knocks on Tibbs was that he was overworking the starters. You know, Jeff Teague came out publicly saying that the starters were a bit tired. Um, you know, that criticism on Thibodeau, did, did you feel like he was going a little bit long with the starters during during that season with the, with the Wolves? I mean, that's just kind of who Tibbs is. You know what I mean? Like, he really relies on his starters. Um they're going to play a lot. You want to be a starting player on this team because you're going to play a ton of minutes. Uh, but what I will say about Tibbs is nobody's more prepared. Nobody loves the game like that. You know what I mean? He's he's really prepared every single night. He he loves the game, you know, and uh, he's, he's had a lot of success coaching, you know. So no knock on Tibbs whatsoever. You know, him being um, a coach, every time he's had a team, they've usually gotten better. You know what I mean? From the Chicago days to the, uh, Timberwolves days, we made the playoffs that year. You know, we were, mm-hmm. I believe, four or five seed mostly the whole year. You know, so we they had to make the playoffs in 14 seasons. So I have nothing bad to say about him at all. And and also, you know, another criticism that he's taken is in, in terms of his scheme. A, a lot of the naysayers don't feel like his defensive scheme it can keep up with today's NBA. Uh, his offensive scheme a bit outdated. What What, did, what would you say about that? No, I think he just plays to his team's strengths, to be honest with you. You know, he had Derrick Rose when Derrick Rose was the MVP. Our strength uh, when we were in Minnesota was, um, you know, getting the ball in the cap but letting Jimmy work. Jimmy took a lot of mid-range shots, but we're not going to – you know, Jimmy's our best player. We're not going to say shoot three just because it's what the numbers say. We're going to play to our strengths, and I thought Tibbs did a good job of that. Now, we also have Mike Woodson also in the running. You, yeah. you have been on record on, on Twitter, uh, casting your vote for Woodson. Well, what do you think Woodson could bring to, to a young Knicks team? Well, I think, well, first off, I enjoyed uh, playing for him. I really did. He was, you know, that's the first time I ever came off the bench. And he was like, I want you to lead the league and scoring off the bench. And he really hammered home the importance of a six man to me. Uh, and then I played for him again in L.A. He was the assistant coach. And he was unbelievable. And I think for the Knicks, that was the last time they made the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken. He was at the helm. Or, you know, it was the last time. 54 and team. Right. And team, yep. I just think bringing him back, getting a chance to really uh, finish what he started, you know, I think that would be incredible. You know, and, and he's just – I know Wood. He played the game. He played at this level. I know what makes him tick. I know how much players respect him and love playing for him. Um, and he knows how to – he knows how to coach, you know, and, and hold everybody accountable. He's going to be a straight shooter, but he also knows how to understand, you know, and, and I just love playing for him. I thought he would be – it would be great for him to get a chance to finish what he started there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that, that you say that because I interviewed uh, Raymond Felton, Rasheed Wallace, and Kenny Martin. They all say the same thing. You know, yeah, a guy that's going to hold the players accountable, but, yes. but a player's coach at the same time. Absolutely, and, and – if you ask most of his players consistently, and I didn't even know they said that, but that's just the the vibe and the feel that he gives off at all times. That's that's what's up, man. You know, JC, in your days with the Knicks, um, the most exciting time for me was clear that fifty two point game against the Heat. <laughs> well, Thank what you. do you if you if you ever recall that game? You know, what was your favorite memories of that game? My favorite memories, and I always tell kids this at my camp. If you go back and look, I started zero for four. So I missed my first four shots and to have the mental resolve to be like, instead of being like, Hey, it's not your night. Be like, nah, you know, you just need one to go. And everybody will always see the points, but that can't happen without, you know, my coach at the time, Isaiah Thomas drawing up plays. It can't happen without Stefan giving me and Nate and those guys give me the ball in perfect position. It can't happen without Q rich passing it out, you know, for threes or Channing Fry setting great screens or David Lee, you know, screening. So when a person scores like that, it's never just that person. There's so many other things that factor into it. There's so many other people that factor into it. Of course, the person who scores the points gets the credit, but it's it can't happen without your teammates and your coaches. And it's so cliche, but it, it's real. Like I've scored 54 different times, and not one time did I do it by myself. You know what I mean? It's always been the coaches, the teammates setting the screens and giving me the ball, helping me. I just got the easy part, just making the shot. But what I do remember personally was that was the hottest night of my life. 
<laughs> like that was absolutely the, if I it, CP I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you because I came out with seven minutes to go if I stay in that game and I play the whole time I think I would have got 65 easy easy like not even yeah. forcing that because well, I have 42 straight points without a miss like from the end of the first quarter to the third quarter I didn't miss one shot every time down court it was like a video game so if I don't come out that game I think I get 65 easy I agree with you, man, and it even confused me that Isaiah even took you out of the game. Well, I know why he took me out. Mm -hmm. Like, he took me out because if you go back, I think the brawl had happened uh, with Denver earlier that season, right? Mm -hmm. Or either earlier that season or the end of the season before I forgot. But Isaiah just had a respect for the game as far as when they take out their best player, we're taking out you. So I came out when Wade came out, if you go back and look at it. When they took Wade out, he was like, okay, it's time for you to come out. He's always big on respecting the game and, and, you know, not getting to the personal part of it as far as just, you know, the respect of it. When they take out their best player and say they're done, you got to come out too. You, you know, you, you mentioned that this that night couldn't happen without your teammates. And when I look back on yeah. those years, I liked on paper what Isaiah was trying to do. You know, he brought in I Steph. I, I loved it. Brought in back the hometown kid. Uh, he brought you in Q Rich. He traded for Eddie Curry. We had young rookies in Nate, Channing Fry. Uh, you had D Lee Maybe. as well. You know, double double. Always had a knack for the for the ball. You know, but you, but you guys just didn't have as much success. You know, what do you think? If you could put your finger on maybe one thing that you you could have done differently, or as a team, you guys should have done differently. What do you think that that would have been? I'm not sure, CP. To be honest with you, because. Like you said, I love the pieces he put together. The Eddie Currys, the Zach Randolphs, the like. If you look, and I've heard Isaiah say it, if you look at all those players and how their careers panned out after that, right? Looking at Channing Fry won a championship, Eddie Curry wins a championship, Zach Randolph is the leader of grit and grind, David Lee makes the All Star, and I believe wins a championship. Uh, my success with the six mans, and and just like if you look at all those pieces and how they played out. You're like, dang, if they was all together, you know, we were, <laughs> right? So I think that's more on us than anything else because he, obviously he brought everybody in. We kind of got to figure that thing out and we never did. What, what do you think is the key to surviving in New York? You got to have thick skin. You really do. But, and I wish we could have made the playoffs there because the energy that the garden brought every single night, it felt like I was on stage performing. So I have two jerseys. Obviously, now I've played on nine teams. I have two jerseys in my house. Um, I have the Knicks and the Clippers. And those are my two favorite places to play. So, you know, it's it's like no other. I actually was in New York, not this summer because everything's happened, but I think it was last summer. And I went to a J concert. It was the um, B-Sides 2 concert. Oh, and yeah, me and my yeah. wife went for two or three days. And just the energy still, like when I was walking down the street and the people – they always associated with me with the Knicks. And it was just love from that standpoint, like just genuine, true love of, of people being thankful, you know, what I did when I was there. And I'm thankful for it. It's a lasting memory indeed, JC. And hopefully we get back to prominence, man. But, you know, my last question to you is, hopefully this won't be the last run for you at the NBA level. Um, but if it is, you know, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want the, the fans, the, the future fans who had never seen you play in your prime? How, how do you want the fans to remember Jamal Crawford? Uh, I want them just to remember, and, and this is, sounds so cliche, but it's so real, that he was a, a, a good basketball player, but he was a better person. And for me, that's that's everything because there's been a lot of good basketball players. You know what I mean? So he was a he was always a stand up dude. He was a classy dude. He had game for sure, and he played like himself. He didn't really play like anybody else, but he was a better person, and that would be enough for me. Well said, man. And, and JC, I definitely appreciate all the time you provided tonight. Wishing yeah. you the best of health and, and success with the run. Hard to root for the Nets, man, but, but we're rooting for you for sure. <laughs> Thanks, CP. I appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll do a part two at some point. A absolutely, man. Stay healthy and good luck, man. Jamal Crawford. Right. Thanks, bro. Peace, bro.
second half. Crawford puts it up. Puts it in. He's got 50! 50. 50 points for Checking his far away.